Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great honor to be here at such a distinguished gathering with such an important set of conversations to be had. It's also a great honor to be here uh, working with my former boss, uh, President Bill Clinton, and actually uh, Rahm Emanuel was one of my colleagues in the White House. Now, I've been thinking about what I heard up to now, and I realize I've been given a pretty traditional task for an economist, and that's to provide some of the well, I won't say bad news, but let me say challenging news. What I've been asked to do is provide some macro facts about the state of the jobs challenge that confronts the United States. And then really for the rest of the time we'll be together through the next two days, it's really to talk about how individuals and businesses and governments and not-for-profits and universities can do something about this challenge. The challenge is big and we should not uh, underestimated. It's important to understand it, but it's also important not to be overwhelmed by it. So I, I apologize if some of the news is uh, appears to be negative, and I'll try to give it a positive spin, or at least a challenging spin. Uh, what I thought I would do is basically talk a little bit about how we got here, a little bit about where we are, and a little bit about the future, and I'm supposed to do this all in about five minutes, and I see the clock isn't yet ticking, so that's good. Um, so, oh, and by the way, I, w I decided to use slides. The reason I did is twofold. N number one, uh, sometimes a picture for some people is worth more than lots of words. And two, I've chosen slides from two very important studies, which I would recommend that you take a look at if you're interested in more of this stuff. The McKinsey Global Institute just did a recent report on jobs in June of 2011. And the Hamilton Project, which consists of a whole lot of people who used to work for Bill Clinton uh, at the Brookings Institution, has a monthly analysis of the jobs challenge confronting America. So the slides I'll be using are drawn from there. Uh, the MGI website, is, uh, the CGI website is all going to make, make these slides uh, available. And finally I should say, and I guess I'm glad that President Clinton has left the stage, is that he, when you do slides with President Clinton, which I did many times for four years, he really reads them and he finds out what the inconsistencies are and he asks the really tough questions. So I assume he's probably somewhere looking at these slides right now and I'm keeping my fingers crossed that they're okay. All right, so let me uh, start. And I'm going to start with the point of history here. When we entered what economists are calling the Great Recession of 2008, 2009, 2010, we did not enter in a particularly strong way. The, the decade of the 2000s, the first decade of the 21st century, was not a great decade in terms of job growth. In, in fact, job growth in the 2000s was half of what it had been in the previous two decades, half. We had a recession at the beginning of uh, the 2000s, we had a job slow recovery, so we were not doing that well in job creation, and then we hit the Great Recession. So that's the first point. The second point that I want to raise is about the median wage. And I only want to bring this up because as we're talking about jobs over the next two days, I think we should also keep in mind the quality of the jobs. It's not just a job that is important, but the quality of jobs. And here I have to say, the evidence for the United States is really quite depressing. If you look at this, this is real purchasing power median wage. They haven't increased for full-time workers in the United States since 1973. That is an unbelievable fact. It is a fact. It is a fact. Now, you might say, but I've heard some numbers that the average real wage has increased. Yes, the average real wage has increased. The median has not, because something else has been going on in our society. We really do have a what's called a polarization of the labor market. We have high skill, high educated, a low unemployment, wage growth at the top, and we have an increasing number of Americans who are trapped in low wage, low benefit, relatively high unemployment areas of the economy, polarization. The median is not moving. If I put the median real wage up there for men, it would actually have declined. If I put it up for women, it's increased somewhat. The median overall has not been increasing. And that's through 2008, that graph. Of course, 2009, 2010, we would not look better. So quality of jobs, keep that in mind as you're thinking about uh, job creation in the United States. 
The next graph just tries to point out that the Great Recession that we entered really is not something any of us have experienced in our lifetime, unless there's anybody in the room who experienced the Great Depression, and I can't see well enough to know if that's true or not. Uh, this recession was remarkably precipitous and deep. And we mustn't forget that because it means the size of the challenge that we confront is much bigger than any post-World War II recession. The next graph is a lovely colorful slide. And this is about job losses that occurred between 2007 and 2009. And, and the colors illustrate some important things about the situation we face. First of all, when you see a green there, green means that jobs actually increased during the 2007 to 2009 period, despite the Great Recession. The dark reds and dark oranges are where the job losses were the greatest. Uh, they were, uh, and the yellows are kind of like job losses or, or not too many job losses. So the greens are good, the oranges and reds are terrible. Now look at what this graph tells you. I want to point out two things, or lots of things it tells you, but again, in thinking about what we're talking about in the next couple of days. Look at those bottom sectors. Educational services, government, and healthcare. That's where job growth was sustained through the Great Recession. So when we're thinking about budgetary cuts at state government, at local government, at community government, when we're thinking about cuts in spending at the federal level, those sectors, education, government, and health, are important to keep in mind. If you go to the top, where were the job losses the greatest? manufacturing and administrative and support services, business support services. So the sectoral composition of the hit was different. But then I want to also then point you to the columns going down because they tell you something else. They tell you as is traditional in US recessions, this is just a much bigger, worse one, the job losses are greatest among the lowest skills. The people who don't have much work experience, don't really have much in the way of advanced education experience, may have some on-the-job training, don't have degrees, don't have bachelor's degrees, certainly don't have higher than bachelor's degrees. So this recession shows, again, the vulnerability of the population without skills. It has been, the greatest job losses have been those with a high school education or less, those without skills and experience, the young, minorities, and by the way, men have been particularly hard hit in this recession because manufacturing in particular and construction are areas where men have a disproportionate share of, the, of their jobs. So that is just important in terms of thinking of, as we're trying to solve the problem, where have the problems been the greatest? The next uh, slide is a slide about manufacturing. I really wanted to point this out. I first met President Clinton uh, in the governor's mansion in Arkansas, and we had a conversation about manufacturing. And President Clinton, at the time the governor of Arkansas, was very insistent that manufacturing does matter. Manufacturing continues to matter. Manufacturing is a sector of the economy which took a tremendous hit all through the 2000s, that, that precipitous decline, that 25% decline, starts with the dot-com recession, and we don't recover. The employment in manufacturing goes down. 5.7 million manufacturing jobs lost in the 2000s in the United States. A, we only have now 11% of our employment in manufacturing. The question for the future, this is a very important question for the future, is can we locate more manufacturing jobs in the United States? And you will hear actually from the panel, and I believe the, the Halle Barber example is a manufacturing example. Very, very important, big uncertainty for the future. Another thing you'll hear about on the panel is the importance of small businesses small business creation. So this is just a chart showing that this recession has been really hard on entrepreneurship in the United States in terms of establishing, launching new businesses. 
23% decline between 27, 2007 and 2010. Small businesses cannot, they've been really, really hit launching a small business by the credit conditions, by the lack of capital. The IPO market has been, until recently, very slow as well. The venture capital market has been very slow until recently. A lot of people start small businesses in the United States on family, friends, and credit cards. All of those things have been hard, hard hit by the recession. So how do we get more help, support, uh, for small business establishments. Very, very important to the future of job creation in the United States. This is just gives you, I just decided to put down some uh, of the most recent numbers. You know, the labor market statistics come out at the first Friday of every uh, uh, month, and they'll be out again uh, at the end of this week. 14 million, you hear the unemployment rate of 9%, sometimes you hear an unemployment rate of 16%. The 16% accounts the number of people who are unemployed, the number of people who are employed part-time but would like a full-time job, the number of people who've dropped out because they couldn't find a job at all. When you add those all up, you get to 16 or so. Uh, and then I also put down the unemployment rates by uh, by education, again to point out that unemployment problems are very different depending upon education levels. They're also very different by ethnicity levels. The unemployment rate among Caucasian white workers, 8%, uh, African Americans, 16%, Hispanic Americans, 12%, Asian Americans, 7%. Gender this time as I mentioned, uh, males have been hit harder. The unemployment rate for men is at 9.5%. Uh, the unemployment rate for women at 8.5%. Those are all very, uh, those are all numbers. Every single group is phrasing numbers which suggest that we have a real uh, problem on our hands and we're here today and tomorrow to try to figure out things to do about it. Um, this chart you can follow monthly, and I do. Uh, it is from the Hamilton Project. It's called the Jobs Gap Chart. And it's attempting to say, what is the jobs gap? The number of jobs the economy would have to add to bring back our employment level to the pre-recession, pre-Great Recession level, and, and employ the about 125,000 workers who try to enter the workforce every month. So our workforce is growing. It's growing by about 125,000 a month. We've got to find, a, we've got to create enough jobs to absorb the new ones and claw our way back to uh, the pre-recession levels for all those people who have lost our jobs. When you look at that, the graph that takes the longest time would suggest we might not close the job gap till 2023. And by the way, right now, that is the path the economy is on, okay? The, the path that takes the longest, that's the path the economy is on. We are growing too slowly right now to get us to faster uh, closing of the job gaps. And that is an important point to uh, keep in mind. That's more of a macro point because to get the economy to grow fast again, each of us can try to do something in our own way, but that actually is a series of macroeconomic policies. Um, I think I have a couple of slides left. This is an interesting slide by uh, McKinsey, and uh, it basically is saying suppose we could grow fast. Suppose we could grow fast enough to get on a fast line so we didn't close the job gap, didn't take us till 2023, and only took us, say, till 2015. So a fast recovery might be we get to, to close the job gap by 2015. But then we have to keep growing because every year we're going to get more workers. The labor force is going to grow. So basically what McKinsey did is it said suppose we got a fast growth economy. And suppose we actually, uh, then we could see how many jobs we might get. We might get a low growth economy, we might get a middle growth economy. So those blues are fast growth, medium growth, low growth, and those wide range of numbers say, well, if you look at the top, healthcare, if we grow slow, we're gonna get maybe 2.8 million jobs. If we grow fast, we're gonna get 5.2 million jobs. So that's how to read all of those things. I think this is interesting for two reasons. Number one, where 
in a medium growth, low growth, or high growth economy, which sectors are likely to generate the most jobs? Well, they're at the top. Health, business services, leisure and hospitality, construction, and retail. Now look at manufacturing. That's a really interesting one. Very important part of the economy. That number right now is saying we're not going to get jobs even if the economy is a high growth economy. That's the challenge. That is a debatable point. So when we're thinking about manufacturing, when you look at that, everything to my mind looking at that makes sense. The question mark is manufacturing. The question mark is manufacturing. By the way, the top RNG space, about 70%, a little less than 70% of all jobs in the United States are already in that part of the, those parts of the economy, those first uh, six places. Uh, if the economy in the medium, low, and high growth scenarios, about 85% of the jobs are going to come from those sectors of the economy. So in thinking about the economy, we can think about cities, we can think about regions, we can think about skills, we can think about sectors, we can think about sectors. So just as a simple example that McKinsey lays out in its report, a sector where the U.S. could actually add some jobs relatively quickly right now, where we've actually lost market share, is tourism. Tourism. Chicago's a great place to be a tourist. We heard from the mayor how easy it is to get in and out of Chicago. The U.S. has lost a significant share of the tourist market. And we, that is a, a hospitality and leisure. Look at those jobs. That is an important area to think about. So think about sectors when you're thinking about jobs. And then the last uh, slide that I have goes to the theme which I think we'll hear over and over again. And this is skills and education. Because what this slide says is that even if we get on the fast growth scenario, even if we get rid of the jobs gap by 2015, even if we create all the jobs we need uh, in high growth that we can think, not that we need, but that we think the economy can generate in a high growth economy, we have some problems. We have some problems. We have a shortage of college educated workers, the negative 1.5 million. We have a shortage of people with some college, but no degree. But look at the excess supply. Look at the problem of skills mismatch. Look at the no high school diploma. Even in a high growth economy, we are going to, we, we leave six, about six million workers without a high school diploma, without a job. We leave about uh, another almost million with a high school diploma without a job. We have a tremendous mismatch uh, between the jobs that our economy can create and the education and skill levels uh, that our workers are achieving. It's very depressing right now to note that uh, right now, student workers with 25 to 34 year old category are less likely to have a college degree than work than older workers than 45 to 60. This can't be we, we, we have we've lost out on our achievements of educational attainment. So whether it's training at community college, it's uh, college education, it's focused training to get jobs that are in particular areas. This I think is our probably our greatest challenge because if we can figure out a way to grow the economy in order to share the benefits in jobs that would be available to large numbers of our workers, we have to make sure that those workers have the education and skill requirements to take the jobs. So those are some of the framing uh, facts uh, that I hope we can all work together to address as we come up with the micro or solutions uh, that you'll begin to hear about with my panel. Thank you very much.